Welcome to Dare to Dream. This is Debbie Dashinger. The show is sponsored by Dr. Dane here in Access Consciousness. They do great energy work out into the world, healing, facilitating, and you can take their classes anywhere. Dr. Dane here, H E R dot com or accessconsciousness.com. Dare to Dream podcast has been nominated for two People's Choice Podcast Awards as well as for a Webby Award. And we were listed in as one of the top best podcasts out of 20 podcasts to listen to this year. So thank you for being with me on this journey and for loving this conversation. Subscribe, like, and just know that every time you send a comment, I read it. I really appreciate it. And I get back to all of you. I'm Debbie Dashinger. I'm a media visibility expert. I teach entrepreneurs, speakers, healers, coaches, how to write a highly engaging book from start to finish to go to from idea to published. I also run a company that offers every author a guaranteed, fully done for you, international best-selling book status. And the third leg of my visibility hub is to show you how to be interviewed on podcasts and radio and get massive results for your business. I've got a gift for you. It's lots of tips about how to write a book and be interviewed. Go to debbiedashinger.com slash gift. D-E-B-B-I-D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R.com slash gift. This episode today features a conversation regarding the dance of ego and essence with a visionary and pioneer in spiritual growth and transformation. My guest today is Dr. Pamela Girali, who shares experiences and insights and captivates readers and audiences with wisdom and practical guidance from the blueprint for the human spirit, her holistic model for conscious, compassionate living. Mm. Pamela is a registered nurse with a master's degree in public health and a doctorate in holistic health sciences. Dr. Gurali is the empowering author of The Dance of Ego and Essence, an intuitive healer and inspirational speaker. And to learn more, go to drpamelagerali.com. And with that, I very joyfully welcome Pamela to Dear to Dream. It is so great to have you. Unmute, my love. Yes, and she looks gorgeous. So if you're, <laughs> if you're on podcasts, you want to also go to youtube.com slash Debbie Dashinger and see Pamela in her amazing coral outfit. Thank you. It is so delightful to be with you today, Debbie, and to just be in your presence and to feel this lovely energy that's flowing today. I'm just real excited to be here. Awesome. Yeah, I like that. I'll have some of that, please. Thank you so much. Um, Yes. So to your book, The Dance of Ego and Essence, in it, you share this extraordinary journaling experience. I want to know more about that journey and why 40 days? What does that number mean? Yes. Well, I, like most interesting things that happen to us, there's usually a pivotal moment. And I had viral thyroiditis, which flatlined me for about six months. And I'm very active, very almost hyper. And so it was not easy to lay there and just allow my body to heal, but it did. And when that was over, I asked for guidance on where to start working again, because I had this beautiful gift from the universe called the Blueprint for the Human Spirit. And uh, I'll share a little bit about that in the future, but I wanted to do something very special and very unique to share this gift. So I thought I would be told to just pick up where I left off on a couple of incomplete projects. We all have them in our computers. We've abandoned them for other things, but I thought I would be encouraged to do that. But no, the higher powers that be encouraged me to get up early and to journal confessions for 40 days. Well, confessions in me don't get along real well because I grew up in a 
very fundamental Christian religion and a very conservative home. There was uh, what I call the unholy trinity of guilt, shame, and fear. That's hilarious. <laughs> I love that. That unholy I was trinity. raised with. <laughs> but I went to my office, lit a candle, sat in the silence, opened my heart and my mind and my entire being. And in a few minutes, a word came to me, discipline. And I had this visceral reaction because I don't like that word. I don't like the idea of discipline. I just don't want anybody telling me what to do or what I can or cannot do. And as soon as those feelings flooded through me, I thought, oh my goodness, there's my first confession. So I grabbed my journal and I wrote it down. And in the next hour, a flow of, of experiences just poured through me onto the page and I relived certain experiences that I had. Uh, discipline was because of the fundamental religion, it was very harsh and I was um, hyperactive. So my mother's favorite discipline was for me to stand in a corner. Well, that was torture. <laughs> It was absolutely torture. And uh, in the process of writing this, I, I realized that discipline eventually becomes self-discipline. We integrate it so that we can learn how to say no to certain things so we can say yes to things that are far more meaningful and important to us. We can choose our direction. So discipline becomes direction. But all these experiences came flooding out. And with it, I realized that my little antique desk where I work is sitting in the corner. <laughs> oh, wow. And I thought, oh, my goodness, you know, have I put myself in the corner? But then I realized, no, I can see out in my backyard where I have these beautiful cypress trees. I can see the doorway. I have the beautiful pictures in front of me. And, you know, I work in this inspiring sacred space. So, so it's still in the corner, which is a trigger and amazing you would notice that. And yet you've recreated things so that that corner doesn't have the same meaning for no, you. No, it doesn't. No, it's, it's entirely different. But um, the other thing that happened when I finished writing, just what popped up was this beautiful affirmation. It was almost the exact opposite of the confession that I had written at the beginning. And it affirmed that I was disciplined and in harmony with divine order and that all was, I mean, it was just beautiful. So the thing about the 40 days was interesting because I wasn't sure why 40. And when I woke up this one morning with this idea that I had to journal confessions, I said, okay, I can do this for 20, 21 days. You know, they say it takes 21 repetitions to create a habit. I thought 21. And it was like, no. <laughs> so I thought, okay, 30. No. 40. So I thought about it. I did a little research and, and realized that 40 has very special meaning. It is the number of rebirth. Hmm. There is 40 um, weeks gestation. There was Jesus spending 40 days in the wilderness mm -hmm. or in, in the garden. There is the uh, 40 years that the uh, Israelites uh, were in the wilderness. I mean, there's a lot of 40, 40 days of rain in the flood. So there is a lot, uh, very important significance with regard to the 40. But every day for 40 days, I went to my office and we were away for a short period of time, but I still got up and I did this process and I was flying. I released so many things. And true, I had been working. I was on my spiritual path for about 
25, 30 years by then. And so I had done a lot of letting go. I had healed a lot, but yet some of this stuff stays with us. And this gave me a chance to see how far I had grown, how much my life had been transformed. And I was able to even bring up some things that I had hidden, had never shared with anybody. And it was the most amazing experience because I felt almost euphoric. I had let go of so many things. I was flying. What a gift. What a gift. You know, I love what you said about discipline, Dr. Girali, because I have always said discipline equals freedom. And that is, has been my experience, for instance, around food. You know, for a long time, I needed discipline around food. Um, and what I found is that when I really cleaned things up, that there was this enormous freedom. Obviously, there was health that came with it, but also there was great ease and great results. And, uh, and it's funny because the famous podcaster, Jocko Williams, the military guy, says that all the time, but he stole it from me, me for sure. <laughs> And I'm so curious when you tell this story, this commitment for 40 days, I'm going to confess, here's my journal and I'm going for it. Besides discipline, just give us some examples, because if there's people out there who say, you know, that sounds like something I might be willing to do. Can you give us some more examples of things you confess to yourself and possibly the universe? Yes, there were so many, and I believe that they are universal issues. There are things that we all face and deal with so that I know that when I uh, share my experiences, other people will as well. For instance, um, aimlessness became purpose, and um, prayer and pleading became presence. So instead of praying and pleading and begging God for something, we're sitting in the silence, in the presence of God. Um, I tend to be a creative soul and I see all kinds of possibilities. So I was always scattered and that uh, became focus. There were so many ways that my life had changed um, that I just felt sharing this would be an opportunity for other people. The idea of being so radically honest mm -hmm. was not an easy path either. But I started this process and a couple days later, I would send what I had written to my friends. <laughs> And they were so blown away by it and said so much of their own stuff came up that they said, you mm -hmm. have to share this. You have to do that. And I had no intention. This was my own experience. I had no intention of um, airing all of my dirty spiritual laundry <laughs> with the world, so to speak. <laughs> but I know that it was meant for a higher purpose mm -hmm. and true we are here to raise our own awareness. We are here to learn and grow. And so that inner purpose is paramount, but also there are opportunities for us to share that with others because our experiences open the door for other people to learn and grow as well. So my passion for the blueprint and for this experience that helped reveal exactly how the blueprint had impacted me and how I had learned and grown, it became something that I uh, just had to share with others. When you give us this perspective, that looks like what flowed out of you as a confession, and then what was revealed to you as the opposite, the antonym, the way out to heal yes. that. Is this how you came up with the affirmations at the end of your book? Well, 
they just flowed out of me, just like the writing flowed. It was almost uh, automatic writing, but it was my own experiences. So I just, I just let them come. And I was surprised that they uh, were there. But when I looked at the whole, cha each chapter, each day, and saw how the pain of my confession was transformed through my experiences and then revealed itself as this beautiful, positive statement that reflected where I am now and how I believe and how I uh, express the truth of my being now. I mean, it was, it was a big shift. So going from the negative to the positive, looking at how everything just was allowed to bubble to the surface so that it could be transformed in so many positive ways. That was huge. And there was another thing that happened. Um, my days were pretty well spent working on this. I wrote for an hour, but after going for my morning walk and working out, then I would come back to my office and I dictated it into my phone so that it would, I didn't have to type it. <laughs> and I would suggest that's an interesting way for people to, to write and to commit their handwriting to uh, something in a more um, concrete form. And so then I worked with it. I fixed it up a little bit and shared it. And then in the afternoons, I sat and just focused on this. And a meditation came to me as well. I received and I just recorded them. They were about two and a half minutes just summarizing and affirming along with the, the affirmation. And those are a part of a journal that I have that's a companion piece that goes with the book as well. It's called uh, Embrace Your Divine Inner Diva. And it has an opportunity for everybody to go through the process with me because it's such a powerful um, experience. And I also believe that um, there is more to it than just the writing, because it's almost like a whole body experience. If um, we expect to learn just by, you know, through our heads, it takes a lot to get through all those grooves that are so deep in our brains that make us kind of continue to think and behave and function in the same way. But when we integrate all aspects of our being so that it becomes more of a, a holistic experience, it's not just journaling, but it becomes like a holistic experience, then we truly have a chance to make greater shifts in our life because we put it into practice. So I have this really cool, it's more than a journal, it's an experience as well that goes with the, the book. You mentioned divine diva, and um, you've got this term divine diva essence, which really has a beautiful energy to it. What do you mean by us having a connection to our divine diva essence? Explain that. <laughs> well, essence is our nature, our spiritual nature. Of course, ego is the part of us that strives to be more, that wants to, you know, be better, that doesn't realize the uh, imperfect perfection that we are, so to speak. And, but essence is pure. It is who we are. And I just, because I love to sing and dance and all that, uh, the, the whole diva uh, idea came to be. And it, to me, it is how we express the truth of our being. We show up as the hands and the heart and the voice of God. I mean, that is what we do when we allow the spirit of God to flow through us, to show up as us, and we become and dance like this 
perfect uh, diva essence, so to speak. So I just uh, like the idea of the divine diva, even though if you look at what diva means, it's like saying divine, divine. <laughs> In Italian, you know, the diva, it it's, means divine. Oh my gosh. Okay. That's a beautiful, I wrote it down as a quote. You just said, we show up as the voice, hands, and heart of God to dance like the perfect diva essence. That's gorgeous. That's very goddess kind of yes. nice thing. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So you have mentioned several times that you created this blueprint. So I wanna talk about how can this blueprint for the human spirit be used as a roadmap for personal and spiritual growth? What can people do with it? Yes, well, before I answer that question, may I tell you a little bit about how it came to be because it was a miracle. I- oh, Yes, I would expect no less of a miracle <laughs> from you, my dear. Yes, please. Yes. Well, I had uh, left my uh, fundamental teachings behind and became very involved with my career. And I was a uh, perfectionistic workaholic for many years, working with nonprofit health organizations in progressive leadership positions. And I worked for the American Cancer Society for Prevent Blindness America. I mean, I was the program director for the whole country for Prevent Blindness America. It was a really cool job. I mean, I loved it. And when I worked for the Cancer Society, I traveled around and, and helped uh, many states with their programs. So I had amazing experiences and I loved my career. I loved the idea that I could make a difference and help other people. While I was at Prevent Blindness America, um, if they had a project that they wanted finished on time, under budget, with the best materials and products and the best delivery system, they asked me to lead the project. But if they wanted everybody to be happy with it, they didn't necessarily ask me because I was a bulldozer. I mm. pushed and pushed myself and pushed others to achieve more and more and more. It was like never quite good enough. And if you think about that, that is a reflection of our uh, worthiness and a reflection of how we feel about ourselves and our past. Because I was told time and time again that I was unworthy mm -hmm. and about original sin. Nobody ever told me about my original divinity. Oh. That's beautiful. Nobody yes. ever, ever told me that. But here I am working my little tail off and I was given the opportunity to go to the Center for Creative Leadership in Greensboro, North Carolina. And it is an amazing place. I did an extended program. We spent a week there and then went back a couple of times and we did visioning and journaling we worked with change partners, actors, social workers. We took nature walks. I mean, that was the first time I had ever done any of that. Mm. And it had such an impact on me. It was like almost like a conversion experience, you know, because it, I, I awakened to this vision. And I went back to work and changed how I approached my job and the people I worked with. But I also realized that my job was no longer compatible with my new vision. So I quit. I retired early. I was in my 30s, late 30s. I had just gotten remarried to this wonderful man who is my biggest supporter. And um, so I left that behind to become a spiritual seeker. And in the process, I read everything I could get my hands on. And I tried every practice. And I went to every holistic expo I could get to and studied all the masters, past and present. I was a consummate seeker. I just couldn't get enough. I, and I was also fearful 
about this because I was so afraid that I would be led down the wrong path by some spiritual shyster and not have enough discernment to know what was true or not for me. So I had all this fear from my background. I mean, everything that wasn't a literal translation from the Bible was deemed to be uh, wrong. And, you know, off you go into the dark forever, you know, so I was very much afraid. But I thought, you know, I just was compelled to seek. And I think we all go through that seeking phase uh, in some way, at some level, because we want to know truth. We want to discover who we are. We want to know why we are here. And um, I had no idea. But eventually, um, I was... Um, I had a cue. I went to see a medical intuitive and asked her because I was having some stomach issues and found out it was gluten and whatever that the doctor said, no, there's nothing wrong with you. But in the process, she told me she saw me working with shapes and they were kind of amorphous and that I would be uh, sharing this with others. And when she asked me if I had a question, I says, well, I'd like to know why I chose not to have children in this lifetime. And she looked at me, she goes, well, uh, in a past life in the early 1900s, you lived in Appalachia in poverty. You went through three husbands, had 22 children, many of whom died. <laughs> and you said you could never ever go through that again. And then she said, and how could you be the mother of the earth and bring forth this beautiful gift if you had so many responsibilities in your life? Mm. And I had no idea what she meant. Mm -hmm. But two days later, I was awakened at 3.30 in the morning and all this information started flowing in. And it started as a simple mind, body, spirit triangle, which I had heard about before, but it kept growing and growing. And three to four days a week for six months, I was awakened and all this beautiful information floated. These divine downloads were so powerful. And I was given the opportunity to learn and test it and integrate it as it went. So this blueprint evolved and kept growing and growing in harmony with my understanding and my personal growth so that it became like my passion and now my purpose. Every day I would walk with my husband and I would tell him about the latest download and he just Oh, that sounds good. You know, <laughs> he had no idea what I was talking about, but I had not only like this little chart that was forming and growing, but I had sacred geometry that went from the triangle to a tetrahedron, then with a center point and it grew and these spheres and- Are like you saying that you were getting a download of, of a- sacred geometry vision that kept growing and mutating and changing or that you had several of these sacred geometry visions? It just kept growing and growing. And it reflected exactly what the matrix that was growing was. So, and I didn't know what sacred geometry was until much later, but it's uh, compatible with like the Merkaba and everything else. It was like, I was downloading all this stuff and putting the pieces together. And I think that is what was so powerful because life is very complex. There's so many different aspects of life. You know, there's this physical body, we have these active minds, this heart of gold that we have and our intuition, this gut that tells us things that are right or not. And, and the sum total of it, you know, this spiritual, integrated spiritual aspect of life that we are, this essence of our being. So it all just 
brought all these pieces together. And I may have heard little bits and pieces from different people that I had read about or from uh, all the different studies that I had done, but it came together and it was so beautifully laid out because I kind of have a logical, rational mind. So it made a lot of sense. It was so perfect. And so I'm assuming this is a huge life change to go from the childhood you've described, Dr. Girelli, to saying, oh, I'll be a seeker. You know, I had this great experience in North Carolina. Let me, let me invite in and read a lot of things. And then all of a sudden the divine starts gifting you with all of this. And is this also what you use while you coach and help people and speak? Absolutely. Everything that I do is about the blueprint. It is my passion and purpose. And when I work with people, when I speak about the blueprint or write about it, uh, present it in a book, it's, it's always there in some format or other. And when I do healings, I can see exactly on the matrix that I have for the blueprint where I'm working with this individual, because it may be a physical thing. It may be a, an emotional issue. It could be related to them personally or relationships or part of a, a bigger picture. And so it becomes a, a fabulous way to just kind of understand. And when we look at the the blueprint matrix, which I talk about. And if anybody wants to see what the matrix looks like, you can go to my website and under offerings, there's a, a page for the blueprint and it shows you the chart. And each, uh, it now has 25 boxes in it and I'm sure it'll probably grow some more, but uh, there are 25 boxes. There's five dimensions that I focus on, the physical, mental, emotional, intuitive, and spiritual and five um, fields of existence, which are quantum or energy, self, social, global, and eternal. And the, the self level is all about discovering who we are. When we figure that out and put it together and integrate all these aspects into one coherent whole, we can be authentic and express the essence of our being. So that is the intention in the self level. In the social realm, it is all about why I'm here. I mean, these are universal questions that everybody asks, why am I here? And it is how we serve and how we live purposefully, how we relate with others. And we may be caregivers in the physical, we may be teachers in the mental, we may be partners and have intimate relationships, we may be leaders and use our influence and our power to empower others. Uh, but all of it comes together into this beautiful uh, way of understanding who we are, why we are here. And then in the global realm, it is more about um, how I'm connected with the whole and how I leave a legacy that'll last forever. Yeah, absolutely. It's beautiful. Yeah. You do so much work, if you don't mind. I want to give some things to the listeners and the viewers, because there's a lot of interesting things going on in the world and you have a lot of wisdom around this. So let's talk first about going from anxious to adventurous. Um, in your work right now, you talk about that in regards to the feminine spiritual development. Is that just for females or is it the feminine within us all? And how do you suggest the feminine goes from anxious to adventurous? Yes. Well, um, there are about five qualities of a divine diva that I focus on. And one is adventurous as opposed to being fearful. And, if, and certainly that is something that um, we can try. But, you know, some of us are a little more adventurous than others. And my father was very adventurous. He, he had more near-death experiences than you could imagine. And he lived on the edge, you know. And um, so maybe I got a little bit of that from him. But to me, uh, we go from being fearful to adventurous in, in a, uh, as we let go of 
the past and the fear that we have that's really related often to our past or to the collective unconscious, to everything that has come with us into this lifetime from previous lifetimes even, or from um, others. You know, we, we have a lot of uh, baggage that's ours and uh, universal. And so we can transform fear in a variety of ways. Um, we are so, um, uh, life has been very stressful lately. And we typically react to stress because of fear in some very unique ways. I mean, we all either freeze, you know, so that we can't move. We may um, flee or run away from it. We may uh, fight or we may fuss and fume and complain. You know, all of those things are pretty negative. But we can transform our reaction and how we view our life experiences in the past and the fear that we may have for the future because of what goes on in our lives or in the world, pretty chaotic. Um, and I think there are some very simple things that we can do to just bring us to center. Um, and true, there are many people that are in situations that are far beyond this and need professional help. But I, I have found that I personally can shift quickly out of fear by doing about five things. And the first thing I do is to take a deep breath and exhale and just let go. And as I exhale, I allow whatever is hanging over my head to just go away from me as much as I can. And then I close my eyes and just focus inside and focus on the that perfection that we are that essence of our being and that and you can feel when you're in the the moment when you're in the spirit and then i smile and you cannot be fearful and paralyzed if you smile because it changes all of these things change our body chemistry you know, we go from having stress hormones of uh, adrenaline and cortisol to having more endorphins and oxytocin and serotonin, all those wonder. I mean, we have an inner pharmacy that we can activate very quickly by doing things like smiling and by um, opening ourselves uh, and uh, everybody knows about probably about the uh, Wonder Woman pose that if you put your hands on your hips and open up your, your chest and your heart, you stand and for two minutes, you know, you are empowered, you know, so we can shift our body chemistry out of that fear mode that contracts us and makes us feel less than we are, because that's all part of ego. And, and when we open up and smile and, and even putting our hands in the prayer pose is a powerful symbol because we put all every meridian energy meridian that we have in our body is all brought together into one when we use the prayer pose. Now, that's a powerful thing to do. And I could never, you know, because I grew up like I did, you know, I was never big on things like that. But just little things can make a difference. But we need to continue to allow our intention to uh, bring forth the highest good for us and so that we can share the love that we are. But I do believe that we can go from being afraid to being more adventurous, to go from being like aging, you know, I'm a great grandmother, <laughs> and uh, to being uh, ageless, because essence is ageless. Essence is unlimited. Mm -hmm. Essence is fully accepted, beautiful, 
part of the whole where uh, aging kind of brings us down, where fear brings us down, everything that uh, makes us contract mm -hmm. uh, limits us. Mm. We don't have to do that. Yeah, yeah. And for people who would like to reconnect with their true spirit, um, yeah, it, that's kind of a powerful one for me right now because I had a healer recently who did an exercise with me and literally in minutes reduced me back to authentic self. Yes. Um, and I've been using it on my own because it was so powerful. It was never his intention when he did it, but it's like, okay, <laughs> this is a great tool. Tell me about yours. What do you use or do? Yes. Well, as the blueprint was evolving, so was um, the my intuitive healing work. And as someone who was trained in science mm -hmm. and was very left brain, rational, logical, intuition was way beyond what I ever considered as something that I had or could use, but it kept evolving. And in the middle of the night, I would think of somebody, you know, this is where a lot of things happened about 3.30 in the morning. Um, uh, I would think of somebody, a family member, a friend who had an issue. And I would, it was almost like a form of prayer. And I would see them uh, and uh, envision the best for them. But I was moving energy around. My hands were actually moving. And um, when somebody would tell me about an issue, I would say, well, would you like me to pray for you? And they would say, sure. So I would lay down <laughs> if it was in the middle of the day or whenever, because that's where all this happened. <laughs> and I would open my mind and heart and, and just allow that to go. And I would see imagery. I would see uh, almost like answers. I would feel that my body actually went into motion. So I'm very clairsentious. Mm -hmm. And that evolved to the point where I realized I could talk. My sister and I were talking and she had done a lot of healing work also. And uh, she kind of blazed a trail for me. And so I said, you know, if I could just talk, then I wouldn't, I could, because I was trying to write things down and remember things to tell people. And I says, I wonder if I can do that. And she was in Pennsylvania. I was in Chicago. And, and uh, she says, well, do me. So I got this little tape recorder. I laid it on my chest. I'm laying there in bed. And I spoke in first person. How do you mean? Can you give an example of that? I was her. I became like a mirror and, and was speaking on her behalf. Mm. I was speaking as her higher self mm. to her. Cool. And there were a series of like, and this happens now, you know, when I work with people, there's, it was a series of like five or six scenes and each one was an issue that um, came forth. And I would take a deep breath. Well, I always start, of course, with an affirmation of open, ready, and willing, and for the highest good. And and um, and then I close my eyes and take a couple deep breaths, and my body just goes into motion. And so, if I'm rocking back and forth, I am. This is indecision. Hmm. I just know what it means. In fact, I had a download in the middle of the night once, and I just just all this information just went right through me so that I knew exactly what every position and every motion and every image meant in terms of, of uh, healing. And I discovered that in the process of working with somebody, when an issue comes up, you know, there's this movement and I always have my clients uh, mirror what I do because I think there's all this muscle memory and they participate in the process and experience it and can feel that also. And in the process, then there's always an answer, a shift, a different way of looking at something, a different way of perceiving. And as soon as you step out of your shoes, so to speak, and become the observer and look at the situation from a different perspective with new eyes, everything changes. And then there was 
uh, revelations about things they could do or shifts or a new way of uh, expressing or being or showing up. It was just, it's just the most powerful thing. And of course, it's quite dramatic because I go into motion <laughs> and act out <laughs> exactly what uh, I'm sensing. Was your sister very pleased with her healing? What was your response <laughs> to that? Well, it was very powerful. And I mean, it started with something very, you know, there were, there were some issues, some very serious kinds of things that happened. Um, and I can't remember them all because I'm kind of out of it when this happens. I'm in an altered state, so to speak. But it revealed to her some answers of why she experienced certain things and how that impacted her. So it is powerful. And the, and the imagery is also really special because I may not know what um, other people, uh, anything about them. In fact, when someone comes to me, I don't want to know because I want a clean slate. I don't want to have my mind jump to conclusions or whatever. And I worked with someone who, uh, and I'm sitting there like playing an air piano. And I'm like, um, are you into music? Oh yes, I'm a concert pianist. And I'm like, wow. <laughs> and um, another gentleman was like a dancer and I didn't know that about him. But so the imagery and the message and the healing is just perfect. There's always a shift to the highest good. There are people out there who are ready, like I'm finally ready to build this positive re relationship with myself. I'm ready, ready to let go of all this uh, mess from the past. I want to have a positive, loving, affirming, valuing, worthy relationship with myself. Are there steps that work that will help people to get there? Yes. And I think, you know, there is a, a process that we go through. Um, we start with fear. And I believe that all fear is based on the perception of separation and duality. And we can move out of that um, as we learn and grow. And on my website, there is a booklet, a free booklet that people can download that includes a little bit more about this. But we go through this process where we um, with fear, we try to compensate. So we become attached to or addicted to certain things that supposedly fill this gap or, or addresses our fears. And it's a poor substitute for what we really need. But then we learn and, and there's a life lesson. And usually the lessons are either in trust, which is more physical, hope, which is a state of mind, a positive state of mind, love, which is more of an emotional thing, faith, which is a gut intuition um, lesson, or grace, which isn't a lesson, but it is a gift uh, in the spiritual realm. So we have opportunities to learn from those experiences and then we ultimately make a shift so that we realize we are not separate from ourselves, from others, from God, from the universe. And um, when we know oneness, what a gift is that? Yeah. Oneness is the truth. It's everything. Absolutely. It is. is there something you do? Dr. Girali, every day that is a ritual, a practice that keeps you really centered, keeps you connected to the divine and functioning in the best possible way? I spend a little quiet time, not a lot, but I, I do light a candle just because I like the scent and the light is important to me because I we're light beings, of course, and I sit in the silence and bring myself to center. I just sit, which isn't easy for me being hyper. <laughs> and um, I write in my journal a little bit. 
But I believe that, you know, we practice and practice and practice. And at some point, we go from being seekers to being seers, or, you know, we go, we make a shift. And we also uh, can learn and as we practice to learn to be present instead of having to go to a place where we are present and then go about our lives. We adopt a lifestyle, a way of being where we are present, where we are in the moment, where we are more conscious and aware of what is happening with us. It's like, instead of going to church on Sunday, every day, every moment is Sabbath. Ah. Mm -hmm. That's nice. I, I just am purposely having a little silence there for people to absorb that. Every day being a Sabbath. Every day, every moment. Yeah. And it's, it doesn't it's... have to be a candle. Candle is your thing, but it can be That's something it. different every day. I've never, yes. I've never interviewed myself, but, but if I did, I would tell people something I do every day is emotional freedom technique. I do EFT tapping mm -hmm. while I walk at some part of my walk. And there's an enormous healing and energy shifting that takes place always, always, always. And um, yeah, it's divine grace for me. I yes. am grateful for who created it and I'm grateful that it's available to all of us. So yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Everybody can have their own ritual and Dr. Jirali, this is dare to dream. So what do you next dare to dream? What are your future dreams and goals? My dream is that the blueprint for the human spirit will fulfill its higher purpose to uplift humanity um, to uh, encourage people to live more authentically, compassionately, and consciously, and in harmony with everyone. And I believe that uh, as I do my part, that is happening. And what and would I'm you so like? Blessed. Yeah, <laughs> you are. You are. You've been really divinely guided through your openings and shifts and it's lovely to have you amongst us in our tribe. What do you want to say here at the end to the listeners? Well, I believe that we are all divine divas and men and women or devos, whatever, um, that we can learn how to balance our lives and how to use ego to express essence. We don't have to suppress ego so much as we have to integrate it with essence so that we can fully express the truth of our being. It is our personality and how we uh, are able to express who we are. Um, there was one other quick thing that happened to me that made a huge shift. And this is probably a topic for another day, but the blueprint for the human spirit was an awesome intellectual exercise for many years. And then I had a meditation. And in the process, I experienced 15 past lives in an hour and a half. And there was one for each box in the matrix, the main primary boxes in the matrix. And each one of them showed a shift in consciousness that was critical for my growth. And I believe it's a reflective of, of what we all, uh, how we all make a shift. And in that process, the blueprint shifted from head to heart. And I think that is another critical shift that we all have to go through. We have to, it has to become a heart and soul and a full being experience instead of just something that we learn because we won't remember it it won't change our how we are. It won't change what we do unless it's a whole body, a whole being type of holistic experience. So to learn that, more about our guests today, go to drpamelagirali.com. It's G-E-R-A-L-I.com. Pamela, thank you so much for coming on the show today. It's been a pleasure. It has been my pleasure. Thank you so much for the opportunity. And I end the show today with this. 
You are a beloved of the universe. You are as beautiful as the sunrise and as ancient as the stars. You are a spark of divine love in human form. Through your goodness and light, flow out into this world. Bless you. Remember to subscribe to this number one transformation conversation called Dare to Dream podcast. And my guest next week is Morgan Daimler. So excited for you to hear this very prolific author, this speaker who is well known because she is an expert in the realm of fairies and elementals, and she is exquisite. Thank you for joining us today. Remember, don't just dare to dream, dare to turn all your dreams into your reality.